Once upon a time, in the hopeful year of 1946, there was a most unconventional couple who met in the most conventional way at dance lessons on Suffolk streets in the famous West End ballroom in Birmingham. She was 14, pretending to be 16. He was 16, pretending to be 18. She was called Sweetie because she lived above a shop where she often helped at the sweet counter after school. And he was called by his friends Stonewall. Sam was his name. But as a cricketer, he would block and block, which was exactly what he did with his mouth. Being a Welsh lad living in Birmingham, he used to often ride past windows where there were rooms advertised to let with signs that read, Welsh need not apply. It was something of a miracle that Sweetie even got to meet Sam because the conventions in her life were that she would be chaperoned. Nothing strange there except that she had seven brothers who formed a wall around her. But the darts instructor, seeing that Sam as a footballer was quick on his feet, placed the two of them together and when Sam danced he whisked Sweetie right off her feet, leading before the song was even over so that she remembered him. And hoping that she'd see him again, she dolled herself up the next time she went to the West End Ball, curling her hair with rags. She hated those hairpins. She said it was like lying on lumps and then putting on black stockings and with a red crayon expertly drawing a red line up the back of her leg. Off she went. And it was easy to spot him. All the other guys were looking pretty suave in their pointed periwinkle shoes and their Italian style mod suits with a straight brightly colored ties thinking they were the bee's knees with their brill creamed hair. Sam was in an Air Force uniform. Now he wore it because it got him in free and it did the trick with the girls but it wasn't really his. He'd borrowed it from his uncle and it didn't feel deceitful at all. It felt more like his favorite radio spy, Dick Barton, who always gets his man. In Sam's case, of course, it was the girl that he wanted and as she walked into the dance hall, he pointed her out to his brother and his friends. And as she walked in, surrounded by a bodyguard of brothers, she looked like a Hollywood starlet. And the brother whistled and said, Wow, she's a beauty. And his friends said, Golly, she's quite a catch. She's a fetch. But no, Sam said. And the brother and the boys held on to his every word because he didn't say many of them. But when he did, they were like gold. She's more than that. She deserves a whole new word. She's butonymous. And they clapped and they cheered and they went over and boldly broke in to dance with Sweetie, each of the boys and his brother, but not Sam, who stood there looking dashing in his Air Force uniform so that Sweetie thought perhaps he was shy and she, having come from Ainsdale over in Lancashire, knew what it was to feel like that. But it was only due to her beauty and the attention she got from boys that she was so chirpy and bright so she longed to have the courage to go over and ask him to dance herself and before she knew it another girl had snapped him up. But when the lady's excuse me quick step struck up with all its jazzy tones she took her chance. She stepped over and she broke in and took Sam's hands and as she did so the man began to sing. There may be trouble ahead but where there's moonlight and music and love and romance let's face the music and dance and they did they twirled and they turned and he didn't say much and she didn't mind as she whispered in his ear next saturday i'll be at cadbury's taking her at her word the following saturday not having the money to climb upon the trolley bus that went on the outer circle and would have got him there he rode all the way into Birmingham in the fog with the cars trailing behind him because it was easier to see a bicycle than their lights in the mist. Finally, he walked in the room. Sweetie didn't wait for him to say a word. She snapped him up as the other girl had done before and she danced with him until they became thirsty and got a drink. Now, this being Cadbury's, there was no alcohol on hand. There was only tea. But he flashed his hip flask at her, and she flashed her hip flask at him, and they smiled and they had a tipple, and she said to him, take a walk with me, in the lickies. The following Saturday, that's what they did, but 
Now she had her seven brothers with her once again, and even if he had the gumption to say something, Sam didn't get a word in edgeways, and he thought to himself he was going to have to get her away from her brothers, and she was hoping he would do just so. Now Sam's brother had a job with Imperial Tobacco and got him a job at one of the kiosks selling cigarettes. And in no time at all, he'd raised enough money to buy some tickets for Sweetie and four of her older brothers to go off on the Seven Valley Railway out to Budley. And when they got there, he bought them all fish and chips and he plied them with cigarettes, saying, I'm just going to take her for a short walk. When they agreed, what he actually did was sneak off with Sweetie back up to the steam railway, climbing aboard their train, they chugged off towards the next stop at Arley, where they climbed out and Sam took her up through the fields toward the wire forest. But before they got there, seeing a hedge and having thought that perhaps Sam would do such a thing, Sweetie said, I'm just going to change it into something more suitable. She went behind the hedge, and in no time at all, her skirt came flying over the hedge where she was changing into trousers, and something about holding her dress in his hands made Sam's heart race. And before you knew it, Sweetie had come from behind the hedge and launched at him with a sweet kiss. There out on the barley fields, and afterwards they walked, through the wild forest, Sam picking wild garlic and nettle as they went and boiling it up with sweet spring water and salt from a pipkin he had. He talked to her about how he was going to get her away from her brothers. Well, you better do a good job because after this stunt, they'll be hot on my heels, she said. Then Sam had an idea. He said to her, tell you what, you earn as much money as you can, and I'll earn as much money as I can, and we'll elope. I'll sail you off to somewhere far away where they'll never be able to find you. Taking Maddie's word, Sweetie became a Saturday girl. Using the permission from her headmistress, she got not just one, but two jobs. One at Woolworths and another selling snuff to men who had dribbly red stuff coming down their noses. And she said it was disgusting to Sam. And he was earning his own money, but they still hadn't managed to evade the brothers until one snowy day. Sam had stashed, just like Dick Barton, a sled behind a tree by a sand bank covered in snow. And as he walked ahead with Sweetie in front of her brothers, he said to her, Jump! He grabbed the sled, they climbed on top of it and slid down the way and off they went. The brothers gave chase. The youngest brother, being the fastest, sped ahead but then stumbled and tumbled and rolled and the older brothers fell over him until they were a whole ball of sand and snow and bitterness. For the brothers' mistake, the older brothers took the youngest and dropped him into the toilet hole where excruciatingly he waded in that excrement until the night soilmen came and took him out. And he was so angry that he vowed that if it was the last thing he did, he would get Sam away from his sister. Quite unaware of all this going on, Sam had taken Sweetie to the pictures, to the Star Cinema in Erdington, where he paid the full nine shillings for the show, for the drink, for the popcorn, and as they sat, even Sam had so much to say, and so did Sweetie, till they were kicked out. And they walked the tree-lined avenues and talked about how they could get away from the brothers. Little did they know that they wouldn't see each other for another two years. And the last time that Sweetie saw Sam, it was when he was playing football for the Ryland Rovers. And he kicked and scored a goal. And as he did so, he turned and he looked at her. And she knew that it was more important that she had seen him score than he'd actually won the game. And she carried that picture of his goofy smile for those next two years as he was taken up by the National Service, which was reinstated and he was put into the Navy. Now, evading the brothers had been something of a lesson for him, but there was a whole new education in store for him in learning to evade the Navy and the men who had some dangerous pranks to play. Like, for instance, when they went up to Leiden and were in the dry docks and couldn't go to the toilet aboard the ship and had to go to a shack beside where a water ran in a trough underneath the men's bums as they went. Some of the tricksters took some fuel and put it into the water and lit it, burning the men's bottoms. Now, you had to be pretty quick to get away from such things. And of these happenings, Sam wrote to Sweetie. 
telling her how he was surviving on this kind of humor and learning to love the goons and he would recite some of their favorite scenes when he got home. But still he had other things to come. He wrote to her once saying that the prince, Prince Philip himself, came to visit them on their ship and as the prince stood to address the men, he was standing upon a crate underneath which it said, when empty, Please return to HMS Dockyard, which Sweetie found so much fun and so witty. And that was what she found when Sam finally came back to her. This man who was confident, different, grown up and so funny. He stood in front of her and he told her how the goons had the scene where there were bombs falling down. And as the bombs fell, one of the goons stepped forward and said, Do you hear that sound, ladies and gentlemen? I wonder what it is. And as the bombs carried on falling, somebody else said, El Alamein, 1943. And the bombs kept falling down and suddenly the sound of chickens and a voice saying, The sound of chickens has been added for those who live in rural districts. And Sweetie laughed and said to Sam, You know, you remind me of Tommy Cooper. And Sam said, Aren't you a Cooper? Well, yes. <laughs> You're not in your relation, he said. I might be, said Sweetie. Well, said Sam, I think it's good for family to visit each other. And so he took her all the way to Liverpool, to the royal court, where Tommy Cooper was doing a show. And Sam had thought that maybe this was far enough to get away from the brothers. But it wasn't. While he had been away in the Navy, the brothers had joined the Secret Service. And using all their spy skills, they'd caught up with Sam and Sweetie. And even though Sam had taken the extra precaution of hiring a balcony seat, he couldn't hide his laughter, which bellowed out so loudly across the auditorium that all the audience looked up at him, and so did the brothers. And before they came to reprimand him about taking their 19-year-old sister so far away from home without permission, Sam had learned something about sleight of hand from Tommy Cooper some more about evasion, and a plan began to plot inside his head. 1953 came, and with it the Queen's coronation. The streets were lined with tables and bunting, and Sweetie's family all gathered together in her front room to watch the television they bought just for the occasion. And using all of this distraction, Sam quickly took Sweetie and whisked her out the back and put her on his brand new Speed Twin Triumph bike and sped off towards Wales, knowing full well that the brothers would be in hot pursuits. He found a hedge as soon as he could, and handing over a bag to Sweetie, he said, I think you better wear something more appropriate. She came back round from behind the hedge, wearing a pink scarf over her head, a blue sash round her neck, and leather overalls. She climbed back on the bike, and they went off towards Pembroke, stopping at a petrol station where there was a shack for cleaning cars. They drove into the shack where Sam's brother was waiting, wearing exactly the same things as Sam, on exactly the same kind of bike, and behind him, a woman wearing a pink scarf around her head, a blue sash around her neck, and leather overalls. They drove out and down to Pembroke, the brothers chasing after them as fast as they could. In the meantime, Sam and Sweetie went up the Cardigan Bay, all the way to Crickieth. But they didn't dally there. They had enough time to take a photo and for Sam to send it as a postcard home, saying how lovely it was to be with his love in Crickieth and putting an address there for a hotel. So when the brothers sped off and went to Crickieth, bursting into the hotel, they didn't find Sam and Sweetie there. They found Sam's parents because he had bought them a holiday. Now the oldest brother said, Baggett, I'm not chasing anymore. He was quite taken with Crickieth. It was a beautiful place and so he settled there. And apparently he's there to this day. Sam and Sweetie were off sailing on a yacht all the way up to Leiden where they were to elope. And when they got there, using his contacts in Imperial Tobacco, Sam sold cigarettes all across the city and they did really well for themselves. All the while, though, Sam knew that at some point the brothers would catch up, so he learned every single escape route. He rode his bicycle and learned the rules of the road in a strange city where there were more bikes than cars. When the day came, they escaped down those routes away from the brothers until the brothers were left in a tangle of bicycles upon the pathway, and Sam ended up puffing and huffing when they had escaped, saying, That's it. 
I'm going to quit these cigarettes. And then he played his final trick, writing a telegram to a friend in Japan that read quite simply, must go to Japan, with a reply coming saying, hi. Now, the older brothers wanted to give pursuit, but one of them decided to stay in Leiden. He liked a city full of bicycles, and so he remained. The other five brothers flew off to Japan, to that land of subtleties where there are 36 different ways of saying yes, and not a single way of saying no. So they found it truly difficult. But somewhere along the way, one of the brothers had fallen in love with a sweet Japanese interpreter, and so he wouldn't give chase any longer. Sam and Sweetie had actually gone off to Malta, that sunlit island where it's said that people don't drive on the left-hand side of the road or the right. They drive in the shade, and Sam knew that would possibly be his escape route as they started a new business. He pulled out a hip flask from his pocket and felt maybe this would be the way to go. So he sent off fine Scotch whiskies to be sent to the island, and he sold them and did pretty well for himself. And then one day... Out in a temple on the island, he made love to Sweetie, the sounds of their sighing echoing through the chambers of that temple, and the brothers caught up with him. Using those echoes, Sam called out to Sweetie, let's go to Amazon rainforest, and off they went, the sounds of their clue reverberating off the walls as they sped off to a ship, and they sailed all the way across the Atlantic. Indeed, in the meantime, one of the brothers delayed in Malta, saying what a beautiful, sunny place this was, and he stayed, so only four were left chasing on the next ship, sailing off to those dark, deep green forests. They didn't find Sam and Sweetie there, because Sam and Sweetie had gone off to Buenos Aires, to the Amazon Rainforest Hotel. And now they thought... How was it that the brothers had managed to still catch up with them and Sam realized it was because he'd become slack, drinking all that whiskey? So he said, that's it. I've got to quit that. If I'm to stay ahead of your brothers, I need to keep my wits about me. And then seeing Sweetie knitting away her time as he spoke his concerns, he thought, hmm, perhaps that's the way to go. With that thought, he set up a business selling knitting needles and patterns and wool all across Buenos Aires and then beyond, the company growing so big that it was international. And in the meantime, those three brothers that were left were out in the jungle. One of them fell in love with a proud Peruvian woman and didn't follow the last two back to England, where they found out and flew all the way out to Buenos Aires. But using his own contacts, Sam had seen the brothers coming and decided to take Sweetie on holiday to Borneo, leaving a message with the clerk to say they were going to their dear caves. When the brothers arrived and intercepted the message, one of them was astounded with this city, so much more cosmopolitan than he had imagined, and he decided to stay. And perhaps he's there to this day. One last brother gave chase, that youngest brother, who'd swore that even if it was the last thing he'd do, he'd get Sam away from Sweetie. He flew off to Borneo. Now Sam and Sweetie had gone to a cave that was dear to their hearts. It was the clear water cave. But the deer cave, as in the animal, was a cave full of three million bats. And that's where the youngest brother found himself in amongst their Foul guano, once again wading in poo. And that was all he could take. He gave up chasing. He gave up everything and perhaps he's there to this day. Sweetie and Sam often joking that maybe he'd found an orangutan and fallen in love. They flew back home to England. 1956. A full ten years after they'd first met and Sweetie and Sam went off to the West End Ballroom. Sweetie thinking it was just a nice tradition, but Sam got down on his knee and finally proposed. Of course, Sweetie said yes, and as a present, Sam gave her a piano. A piano that she still plays to this very day, as all through the years they've loved and made a family to fill their Morris Minor that they bought for £75 second hand. And now they find themselves in their diamond anniversary, surrounded by that family, celebrating a most 
unconventional life.